evening. I first want to apologize profusely for being um, so delayed, and thank you for your patience in sticking around. I'm not sure that you'll find at the end that it's worth it, but I hope that uh, most of you agree that it was. So I'm going to jump right in. I had um, intentions of covering both 8 Spruce Street and Atlantic Yards. I think I'd still like to try and do that. Um, I talk New York fast, um, so I think I can recoup some ground and cover the slides and then open it up for discussion, which I think is probably, at least for me, one of the more interesting aspects of the presentation. So I will um, uh, begin and uh, we will start with um, uh, no slides. <laughs> This is um, apropos. <laughs> okay, here we go. We're in now. It's here. There you go. All right, excellent. So we know why we're here. <laughs> Tomorrow's buildings today, innovations in the skyline. So the first building is New York by Geary. It's a project that we began um, in 2003. And um, I like to talk about this building. In some ways, uh, what it took to build this building is uh, what it took to suffer through the traffic on the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> um, conviction, creativity, civic sensibility, sense of urgency, a bit of grit, persistent patience. And I just like to say that, you know, there's a combination of things that are necessary, at least in my experience of doing this. Um, and um, when you think big and you do big projects, um, you really have to stick with it. It's not an easy business. Um, it's big thinking, um, um, but big challenges. And so uh, this is a project that um, started uh, in a way as a just standard uh, private development. We could have just um, taken the property and uh, put up a very tall, uh, probably uninspired and fairly forgettable residential building at the foot of William Street in downtown Manhattan. Um, we chose instead to try and do something a little better than that. Um, the site, for those of you that don't know of it, is at the foot of the Brooklyn Bridge on the Manhattan side. Uh, for those developers among us, it was a coveted parking lot site to the hospital downtown, um, Beekman Hospital. The hospital was on the brink of bankruptcy and was looking to uh, create more solvency, and so they put the site out for bid uh, to the highest um, uh, bidder. And um, interestingly enough, as an indication of where the market was in 2003, uh, we paid the most uh, th as, than any of the other competitors at $100 a foot. Uh, and hundred dollars a foot for FAR uh, downtown um, would be an unbelievable number even today um, since we saw uh, land prices uh, reach upwards of 400 plus dollars a foot um, in the years that followed. Um, so we in fact uh, secured the property through a competition but it was purely based on price. Purchased it from the hospital um, and uh, it had 808,000 zoning square feet of potential with uh, bonuses uh, that could be obtained through uh, the creation of plazas and uh, nice plazas, uh, an additional um, uh, generous amount of square footage, 90,000 square feet extra. And um, the story of this project is in some ways that it began as a humble uh, site acquisition and um, we thought we could do something uh, unique. And, and why do we think that? Because in this particular location, uh, the buildings can be built uh, without a height limitation. And so uh, we knew we could reach uh, very high, and if we built uh, the plazas on, uh, on both the, uh, the west side of the property and the east side of the property, that we could in fact uh, reach even higher. So um, it started as a, a sort of a good idea. It took hold and we decided we needed probably a great architect if we wanted to do something um, unique. And uh, we had been playing around with Frank Geary in Brooklyn and um, decided to ask him to take a look at the property um, downtown. And so there began a story that in some ways is uh, a little vignette of, of the world that I live in, which is that um, things take a long time, um, that uh, you really do need patience to stick with it and persistence. Um, this is a building that um, we chose to design with an architect that had um, very little uh, local high-rise uh, residential experience. So, you know, for those of you that uh, know and love Frank Erie, most everything is uh, wavy and um, horizontal. Uh, this was quite a tall building. He was uh, completely um, taken with the idea that he would build a skyscraper this high. Um, but just things like New York City uh, building code, ADA, uh, efficiencies, uh, you know, how you put a building like this together uh, was something that Frank had never done. And so we set about trying to support Frank um, in an effort to uh, demystify that process for him and create a great building. And if you uh, have been to the building, and, and I'm happy to uh, 
to take people through the building because it is um, quite a sight to behold, not just from the outside, which you can see here. It's really uh, become a postcard image for Lower Manhattan. It has this wondrous way of changing color uh, as the sun rises and sets on, uh, on one side of the, the island of Manhattan and the other. So it's, it's quite a jewel from the skyline, but it's really special from the inside as well. Um, and what's great about the building is that um, it is uh, a very livable building. Um, it has uh, very efficient apartment units, but it also has uh, the Frank Geary touch. And so in the marketing center where we um, market the, the, uh, the units themselves, this is all rental. So um, uh, when you walk into the marketing center, you see all of the models we worked with to create the building. And the evolution of the design itself is a fascination because the building torqued and turned. Uh, some of the early designs, uh, nothing lined up. Not a single bathroom um, was in the same place. And uh, you know, that's, of course, a horror for a developer that has to deliver the message that there has to be some rationale uh, to the way that the, uh, the, uh, the building stacks. But you know, again, with a, with a collaboration and a real partnership, and I would say that you are not, in this case, a, uh, you know, uh, a client. You are very much a partner of the architect. And I think that, in some ways, uh, the great story about this building is that we pulled it off. And we pulled it off in the face of lots of challenges. Um, this is a building that was uh, purchased at, uh, in terms of its trades at the height of the, uh, the residential boom. So we paid top dollar for every single trade in the building. Um, it was an expensive building to build um, anyway, but we were bidding out concrete and different trades when we had zero competition. And so when you ask a concrete um, contractor to build a building this high where the formwork on every floor moves and changes and you only get one bid, uh, it's not, uh, there's not a lot of leverage there to drive your pricing. And so we went into it knowing that um, uh, we closed the loan, a $680 million loan, on the eve of really the collapse of Lehman and knew the day after we closed that we would uh, unlikely ever be able to close a financing like that in the near future ever again. So you had six lenders, $680 million of financing, you had a market that was uh, coming undone, and you had a cost structure on the construction side that had peaked and was higher than uh, any point in time in the city's uh, recent history. So about 39 uh, stories up, we panicked and said, this is a lot of real estate exposure and it would be a perfectly uh, fine building at 40 stories, and maybe we ought to think about stopping. And um, you know, that's an interesting um, proposition because of course you've paid for so much of, uh, of, of what goes into the full building, but the notion of having all of 903 rental units, all market, um, to, to, to rent in a market that um, was shaky at best. Unemployment was, was peaking. And um, the world was uh, un quite uncertain. This was uh, 2009. And so we took a hard look at the building and we um, took about two months off and said that we would uh, try to contemplate what we should do. We had serious conversations with, with Frank about what would happen if we you know, decapitated the tower. Those are never easy conversations. Um, and um, we talked to our lenders and we called in all the trades. And uh, I, I like uh, to talk about this building because in some ways it's a sign of, uh, of the city's resilience because when we got everybody together, um, everybody wanted the same thing, which is to keep going. And even the trades, you know, there wasn't a lot going on in New York, not a lot of construction. This building represented um, the hope that the city would come back, that the economy would recover. And um, not to be overly sappy about it, I think everybody understood um, uh, what we were trying to do and rallied. So uh, whether it was Frank Geary, who I think said that if he had to um, babysit for people's children in the building in order to get it to keep um, being built, that he would do whatever was necessary to see the full uh, tower uh, constructed. Um, in fact, we, we ended up uh, getting Frank to support the use of his name, which as you know through the marketing materials we have executed on uh, by identifying the tower very much with uh, his brand. Um, and uh, we received um, over $10 million in concessions uh, from the unions. And uh, it was a PLA that was done specifically for this building. And um, it got executed in record time and it allowed us to advance through to complete the construction. And, um, you know, again, as it opened up, we st continued to have the anxiety that this was um, certainly a lot to digest and that even though we're a patient company, it was a lot of real estate exposure. It was never done before. If you look around New York City and you look at the rental product, the bar, I would say, is quite low. Um, you can see beautiful condominium developments by uh, great architects, but there are very few rental buildings that really deliver on a promise of uh, a great architectural experience. Um, you may go into a fancy 
uh, David Rockwell lobby, but once you get into the units, you know, it's hard to tell one building really from the next. And I think that um, that's um, one of the reasons why we thought if we did this, uh, it would be a remarkable thing. And so somewhere along the way, um, we also uh, recognized that Tribeca needed an extra school because the services had been so strained by the previous explosion of residential development. And so we inserted a public school in the base of the building with the uh, support of Speaker Silver, who wanted the school put in the building. And lo and behold, as a company who only does public-private partnerships, we had at first um, a, a true private development with absolutely no public component whatsoever. And we went around and worked really hard to figure out a way to put the school in, and suddenly we had a, pu a public-private partnership with the School Construction Authority, which um, some of us thought we should run the other way because it would only muck up the schedule and screw up uh, the design. And I will tell you that this project's become in some way a poster child for School Construction Authority because sites for the city schools are so sorely needed that they could put a public school pre-K through eight in the base of this building, the first public school ever to be built on private land, was a remarkable thing because it was um, allocated out in a cost structure that allowed the city to benefit from the purchasing of the entire tower. Uh, they were able to control the fit out on the interiors of the school with their own architect. But here they had um, a great school being built um, essentially by Frank Geary. And um, uh, now when you go to the building, not only is it an amazing thing to see people coming into the lobby and, and living in the building and swimming in the pool, but when you go to our amenities floor and you look out the window, you look down and you see um, hundreds of children playing on an outdoor playground that's on a setback location on the fifth floor with a net you know, above it to uh, protect the children. But you have um, oodles of kids. Um, you have all sorts of glamorous people living in the building. You have a hospital operating on the other side. And it's really just, I think, um, a great New York story. Okay. It's beautiful, huh? <laughs> There we go. Okay, so the interiors. Um, it's um, really lovely because there's, uh, there's really not a lot that um, surrounds the building. So what happens downtown, of course, is that spaces become somewhat claustrophobic because there isn't a lot of light and air. So we get the benefits of calling it a downtown Wall Street location, but with the low-rise hospital on one side, um, beautiful Pace University uh, to the north, and City Hall Park to the west, the building does not have a lot um, in the way. And so everything becomes part of the landscape that surrounds it. And um, these views that you're looking at are from high floors, but they're not from the highest floor, which is 76. So we have um, gone all the way up to the 76th floor, which is the highest occupiable floor. We started uh, the design with eight units at the top of the building, and somewhere in the process decided that uh, we're doing so well on the lease up that we might want to make the units on the top bigger and better. So we've gone from eight units at the very top of the building to three. So these are 3,000 square foot uh, apartments for rent. And what, what's happened in this building is in some ways what's happening in the country, which is this whole notion of untethered existence and renters by choice. And I think that um, because the new world order is different for all of us, and people don't want necessarily to have um, the pressure and be saddled with a mortgage, even if they can afford it. What we see in this building is a fascinating study about what has become um, you know, a valued um, proposition, which is to rent. And we're not seeing this just here in New York. We have offices in, in uh, most uh, urban markets, uh, major core markets, and um, we're seeing a new profile of a renter. So in the old days, it was, you know, you get out of college, uh, you get a roommate, you rent uh, an apartment, put up a pressurized wall, you have two people living in a living room, um, and you're making your way. And I think that um, not every building is like that, of course, but there's been such a departure from the people that are seeking rental products that in some ways it bodes uh, very well for multifamily housing, uh, not just in New York, but elsewhere, because um, we live in a world today where people want to have options, people seem to want to stay lean and mean, and people want flexibility. And um, you know, in New York City, where with rent stabilization, you can't possibly be tossed out of your apartment. You know, it's not as if you decided to live here. If somebody could say to you in two to three years, you have to move out. It doesn't happen in New York. This is a 421A site, so it's a tax abatement. So you have the security of knowing you can stay. You only pay the maximum increases that are provided for by law. And you're basically able to predict uh, you know, your future in the building if you should choose to stay there. So I think it's, very, it's fascinating for, for us to see this emerging trend where people are choosing to rent. And we're talking about sophisticated uh, folk 
Um, and um, I have a little bit later on the profile of the renter in the building because now we have the stats because we're open and um, leasing away. So uh, in the great Rubik's Cube that is real estate, you'll see that the building is over a million square feet. Um, it is, as I said, 76 floors, 870 feet uh, tall. It is um, a combination of residential units. There's a floor of ambulatory care facility for the hospital in the base of the building, which are doctor offices. Um, we have this pre-K through eight public school and we have parking below. And I like this slide for people who you know, study um, the urban environment because it shows you just how much is going on in this tower. You'll see that there's very little retail. The retail is under 2,000 square feet. And why is that? Not because the place couldn't use additional amenities. It's that by the time we're done fitting in all the things that need to get put in, we don't have any room for anything else. And so you have these different living experiences where on one side you have a poor cocher. So you drive right through the site into your front door in your luxury rental. And there's a beautiful uh, field operations garden uh, on the west side of your poor cocher. And on the other side of the building, there are school buses letting off uh, hundreds of kids, 600 plus children, who are coming into the building uh, on this side, off of Strew Street, and, uh, and going to school here in the base of the building. And so uh, it's just this great vertical city. Um, you know, for those of us that believe density is a good thing, it's, and it's, uh, it ought to be um, uh, embraced, I think this is, a, a, I think, a pretty good job of taking uh, a fairly tight site and figuring out a way to make it work. Uh, we were sued. We're often sued. We were sued by um, the residents that live in this historic building here. They bought condominiums knowing that the lot line condition existed, which means that when they bought, they knew we could throw a building up. Now, it wasn't even us at the point in time when they sold the units. It was uh, a parking lot, but as soon as we went about um, designing the building, we had a lawsuit that basically said, um, we don't want you to build the building, you can't build the building, uh, the hospital can't sell you the property. So we ended up negotiating um, a permanent um, uh, separation between our tower and that historic building by putting a 12,000 square foot lobby and the lobby allowed a 12,000 square foot plaza and the plaza garnered the plaza bonus as well but it also meant that forever and a day that the folks that live in the adjacent building were going to have this um, this permanent separation this garden between us and uh, and them and it's turned out to be nice because I think we really won over uh, the local community here the building was tall and when it was being built uh, there were all sorts of um, uh, hazards associated with uh, crane construction. The crane uh, had fallen on the Upper East Side, and so uh, we had uh, uh, taken the initiative to put a $6 million cocoon around the building halfway through construction to put at ease uh, folks' concern that this building was so high and that there was so much activity going on in the tower during construction and that the way the wind blows downtown, that if we could cocoon the entire building as we went up it, that we could prevent uh, any um, unforeseen calamity during construction. So again, this is sort of innovation as you go. It's not like we ever planned to do it. Uh, the building department loved that we were, we were prepared to do it and that we took the initiative to do it. It ended up meaning that we had a little to no incidents when we built the building. And so again, because it is the tallest residential building, not just in New York City, but in the Western Hemisphere, um, we're proud of the fact that it was built safely. Again, this is just a color uh, you know, uh, uh, plan of what happens uh, in the building. This is the plaza I mentioned on the west side of the site and the plaza on the east side, the hospital's here, and these are the, all the uses that go on in the base of the building. Um, so looking at demographics, you'll see that we have um, been on a tear. Uh, we have um, leased up over 500 units in, um, in record time. Uh, we opened in late February, um, and um, we're leasing at a velocity that's twice what was expected or what is typical in a New York City rental. And I would say that that probably means that we left a little bit of money on the table because often what you do when you lease that fast is you pull back and raise pricing. Um, but I think for us, it's such a big building that we really wanna get up to the top and we believe that a lot of the value is at the very top of the building and it's somewhat untested. To have units that are 50 stories and above, uh, everything designed by Frank Deary, we're talking about the um, hardware in the kitchen, in the bathroom, the doorways, the corridors, the lighting, everything was selected by Frank Deary. And so when um, people came running in saying, you know, you're not gonna believe what Frank wants to put um, in the pool tile, it's, you know, puke green or whatever it was. We did everything we could to make sure that Frank ultimately made every decision because we didn't want it to be that Frank was the designer by name, but that in actuality, we picked apart his design and, and chose everything. So for real and for true, the building is a Geary building and it's a Geary building from the inside 
and it's much more than the curtain wall, which is why taking a walk through it and looking at the model rooms is, um, is, is quite fun because it's, uh, it's playful. We have uh, 18 different model units. I like to say 18 different personalities because it's a vertical city. So when you come to look at the spaces, we've shown um, many, many different ways that people can live in the building. It's got unbelievable amenities, and um, it's, it's just a, it's a great project. We're very, very proud of it. And you can see that the average age is 34 years, which for a rental building is mature. Um, you, you often see high 20s, low 30s for, for this, uh, this type of product. So um, as I said, over 50% of the building is occupied. We're now getting to the fun stuff, which is uh, the very, very top of the building. And like I said, it's in some ways untested and uh, we'll um, know soon enough um, whether um, our projected rents uh, materialize. So I'm a little concerned about the video, whether it's gonna play. We, um, we created a trailer um, in the movie theaters in, in, in December and um, Curbed actually, they don't, they're not um, often very kind to us, but they did say that they thought that the trailer might have been better than the movie. Um, it was unexpected for people to sit in a New York City movie theater and see, um, see a, a trailer like that. But um, the uh, marketing has been uh, viral. It's really just started um, from um, people passing by or driving down the FDR and noticing the building. So it's been quite fun to see a city um, take hold of a building like that, embrace it, and then celebrate it. Um, so now I'll jump into Atlantic Yards, if that's okay, and then we can um, open up the floor uh, for questions about both um, when we're finished. So I'm going to move through this um, so that we can talk a little bit about modular housing, because that's uh, a topic I'm very excited about, and I think it'll be interesting for this group. Um, so what you see here is the site, 22 acres. Um, it's 8 million square feet of mixed-use development. Um, 6,400 units of residential, 2,250 of which are affordable. Um, it is the home of uh, the Nets, the New Jersey Nets, which will move here into the new Barclays Center. Eight acres of open space. Um, there are um, many, many uh, infrastructure components to the project. I like to say that there's as much going on beneath the dirt as there is above the dirt. Um, we have um, a brand new subway entrance and a new rail yard for the Long Island Railroad. And so um, you see here the, the sheer um, size of the site. And this is Atlantic Avenue, and this is Flatbush Avenue. Uh, the master plan for the project was developed by Frank Geary. It is the blueprint for the project, and it will remain the blueprint for the project. You can see here that this is the arena. Um, this is uh, an office building, which uh, will not be um, built today in this, in this market, but uh, is slated to be completed over the next decade in you know, some timeline where it's justified. Uh, it'll be an open plaza at the arena opening, and then there are three residential buildings which surround the arena. And then east of 6th Avenue, you have um, platform buildings. So these six buildings are built over a platform that's constructed over a brand new railroad, f uh, a railroad uh, rail yard for the Long Island Railroad. And then the only terra firma in the project, um, which, is, which keeps it really interesting, are these four buildings here. Everything else is, is built upon either very significant uh, mass transit, tunnel conditions, infrastructure, or in fact an open rail yard that's covered with a platform upon which um, the construction will then take place. So it is large scale, uh, it's an arena, an office building, uh, possibly a hotel. Majority of the square footage is dedicated to residential. Modest amount of retail, 250,000 square feet of retail for a project this size is, is, uh, is quite modest. And eight acres of open space. Uh, it is um, LEED silver and gold. It is the first arena to be constructed as a LEED certified um, uh, arena. Uh, it is a neighborhood development, LEED gold, among the first to be certified uh, here in New York City. And then there's a series of um, initiatives uh, which qualify us for the certification relative to the, um, uh, the rainwater storage, the sewage overflow, and the um, uh, waste materials. But um, I'm going to move through this to make sure we um, have time to talk about the final of the presentation. Barclays Center, 18,000 plus seats. Um, it is um, about 700,000 square feet, designed by Shop Architects. That's the image there. Uh, for those of you that have been following the project, it's a dramatically different image than the one we started with when we began. Uh, it was a Frank Geary arena. It's roughly a billion dollar 
um, arena. It involves, as I said, a brand new transit entrance here. That is a $70 million entrance. We are not rebuilding the New York City subway system. We are simply replacing the entrance and it's a $70 million um, project. So that would be like a building unto itself right there. Um, what will happen is you'll come out um, from the entrance, which you know feeds into the, uh, the transit hub at Atlantic Avenue. Um, and you'll be facing the front door of the arena. And from that location, when you come up from the underground, standing in the front of the arena, you'll be under a 3,000 square foot oculus, largest oculus in the world, and you'll be staring into the arena where you can actually see the scoreboard. And uh, if you're driving down Flatbush Avenue, you can see the scoreboard. It has a high level of transparency for an arena. And if you've gone to arenas around the country, you'll, real, you, you'll acknowledge that it's uh, impossible to sort of get in, very hard to figure out where you are. This is an arena that has a high level of um, transparency, not just at the entrance, but around the sides. And that is by design. The design guidelines were developed uh, with the architects, with the city, and with the state of New York. So we are opening September of 2012. Jay-Z made an announcement last week that he will be opening ACT at the arena. Um, we have some other really exciting lineups. I think it'll be about a month and a half of music. And then uh, hopefully basketball will be played again, and uh, there'll be a 2012 season. Innovations, um, exterior wall. The building's exterior wall is core 10 steel. It's rusted, uh, weathered steel. Uh, I like to say that it would be one of the only instances where one would want to accelerate aging. Um, we're taking giant steel panels, and we uh, have them in what I call a giant dry cleaning facility in Indiana. And these panels go through um, on little um, fastenings, and they revolve around um, uh, a system where they're sprayed with rainwater and treated with the elements in a way that takes 15 months of, uh, of aging and shrinks it to three. And this uh, steel corrosion, if you will, is the look that the architects were seeking. In some ways it has uh, sort of a terracotta, brownstone kind of color to it, a very uh, rich and warm patina. And uh, that is the facility in Indiana where they're aged. And then we ship them to, uh, to New York and uh, they are now being erected on site. So we have real curtain wall on the site I think that uh, this, is, this would be one of the great engineering feats of uh, 2010, 2011. And I think that um, as the wall goes up and people start to appreciate, I think it's beauty and it's complexity. Um, I think there's a, a bigger story here about how interesting it is uh, to take these 12,000 panels, all of which were laser cut from a digital model. So it's the introduction of technology, uh, factory work, uh, architecture, and uh, it really creates a tremendous innovation. And I think that if you want to sort of imagine what it would look like, it's the Ford Foundation building. It uses the same materials. Um, but again, this is on a larger scale. And um, I think rather unexpected for an arena. So these are the mock-ups. You know, when you build uh, Roundup, if you know what you're doing, you do lots of mock-ups. I always like to say we built the New York Times building. I think we had 300 mock-ups. And the only mock-up we didn't have is the one that mocked up how quickly it would take you to scale the wall to get to the top of the building. <laughs> so nobody thought about that. And years later, when uh, we realized it really was a giant ladder. So mock-ups don't always address all of the, uh, the circumstances surrounding a new development. But in this case, we, uh, we go out to um, Indianapolis, and then we bring a performance mock-up uh, to Miami, and they you know, spray swamp water on it and make sure that all the gaskets and the sealants are in place. And then we bring it on site, and we do the same thing. So it's a complex process. But the wall is a very significant piece, not just of the architecture, but of the cost of the building. And one wants to get it right uh, from the beginning. So let's talk about the big innovation that we're noodling over, which is this notion that we would very much like to build the residential uh, portion of this project as expeditiously as possible. And often people say, Far City is not going to move forward with the project. Well, I can only tell you that with the um, investment we have in the property, and this is public information. It's hundreds of millions of dollars that are in the project. Um, it is not being done with the intention of building just an arena. So uh, vertical construction is critical. It's what we do, and it's how we make our returns. We're a public company, and uh, we have to finance these buildings, and they have to make sense. So rationalizing new construction today in an environment where financing is, uh, is, is challenging um, to us seemed like something we ought to figure out um, how we could be innovative and create some breakthrough solutions. And one of the things you recognize is that we had a, um, a scalable problem. We had a pipeline. And when you have a pipeline, it makes sense to invest the time and the energy in the solution for the first building. Because if you, if you demystify it and you figure it out, you've not figured it out just for the first building, but you've figured it out for the long haul. 
And so we have been working um, for about two years internally on what I would call an R&D project. And the R&D project is uh, an attempt to roll out, at least initially, one and a half million square feet of, um, of modular um, housing. And modular housing is, is an interesting concept because people think of it um, as um, you know, uninspired, uh, not very good looking, um, architecturally deficient, um, possibly unsafe you know, construction. And I think that in the, in the year that we have um, uh, studied it, it's, it's come clear to us that you can do unbelievable things with modular construction. Um, there's a building in England, in Wolverhampton, England. It's 24 stories. It's the tallest modular building that's ever been built. We went to England last year and looked at that building to try to figure out why was it done there and not repeated elsewhere. And there are lots of interesting theories around it, but the point is, is that what the benefits are are clear and compelling. It reduces your exposure to volatility and pricing. And uh, like the cycle of New York City real estate, the pricing cycle in New York City real estate goes like this as well. So you're often subject to price fluctuation in a way that makes it very difficult to predict in the long term what your construction costs will be. It improves the quality control. You're in a tempered environment. The workers are working in, um, in conditions that are uh, far superior to a site condition. Um, it reduces the schedule dramatically. It's, it's so efficient and it produces buildings that could be put online and units that can be brought to market anywhere from three to six months uh, quicker than a building of similar size built conventionally. Um, it's safer and it's, it's quite sustainable if you think about how much is not happening in the neighborhood and how much is happening in a factory. And again, if the factory is built in New York City, in a borough, it really presents wondrous opportunities to create um, you know, manufacturing um, activity in a city that's uh, struggled to do that. Um, and so uh, there are lots of factories around the city that are dormant and underutilized. And interestingly enough, the modular format is fairly barbaric. It's a hangar you know, in, in, in which you build mods. And you build them um, efficiently and you build them uh, for a building of this size, it's one building and it's 1,000 mods. So we've studied this and realized that what hadn't been done is height. And uh, we have developed a solution to create the height necessary to reach 33 stories. And so technologically speaking, we have had our breakthrough moment and we would um, be doing something that's not been done before. We're really excited about it. Um, we have um, sort of vetted it and checked it out with, uh, with uh, third parties. We have a tremendous um, team of talent, uh, external consultants, and we have figured out the lateral bracing and the load issue in terms of how to build these steel modulars and how to support them on site in a way that will meet New York City building code. And that was the first um, necessary uh, requirement because if you can't do that, you don't really have much to talk about. And so we now stand at a place where we believe we can build it. It will stand up. We believe it will be beautiful and um, we think that we can achieve considerable cost savings. And so obviously the margin on the cost is significant enough, enough that we want to take this issue to the next step. And so that's where we are. And I, I can't tell you uh, in great detail what's going to happen next, except that we um, very much want to hear um, more conversations uh, around modular uh, construction. We think that it would be great for uh, architects, for planners, um, and for the construction industry to talk about modular construction because I think it's, it's, a, it's a, an idea whose time has come. It has a tremendous possibility in the format of affordable housing because of the cost savings. So in New York City, typically when you build affordable housing, you can pay very little for the land because the construction costs are such that you really have to get the land for free. That's what the city often does in its housing programs is it donates the land for the development. Um, certainly not in the case of Atlantic Yards, but elsewhere, uh, the land costs need to be written down uh, to almost zero, uh, if not under $100 a foot for the uh, project to make sense. What modular housing um, would allow you to do is the savings that you garner from construction would allow you to pay something uh, perhaps for land. And so it means that certain sites around the city that might not be envisioned as good sites for affordable housing suddenly became sites that you can put in play and possibly bring online uh, more affordable housing. And then the other thing I'll say is that it's so good looking and it's got so much design potential. It doesn't have to be rectilinear uh, spaces that all look like um, rectangles. It, uh, the um, design competitions around the world, uh, a lot of which have not been built, um, show designs that are uh, truly beautiful. And we are working with shop architects and um, we've come up with uh, beautiful uh, designs for both the exterior wall and the interiors of, of these buildings. And so we think it works not just on an affordable level, but we think it, it also could work uh, for the market rate housing 
and also for condominium construction. So this is a conversation that is, um, you know, a present tense conversation. We have our hurdles. Um, this is um, a project that would be built union construction regardless. Um, you know, there are union, uh, there are factories that uh, use union labor, and then there's on-site uh, union. And so we are uh, going to be having discussions uh, with labor in an attempt to try to um, come to um, an understanding of why this really benefits um, all of us. And uh, it's an idea and, and uh, a concept that we think um, has a great future in a city like New York and elsewhere where density um, matters and where um, height can be achieved and where housing is, uh, is in short supply. So um, we think it will rev revolutionize uh, residential construction. And uh, the first unit would be 360 uh, units and 1,000 modules. As I said, using standardized components, you need lots of repetition. But you can see that the, uh, the massing of the building is, um, is, uh, is, is not um, completely regular. It has triangular uh, components to it. It has setback conditions. And all of this is um, doable, uh, both in the conventional format and in the modular format. So we've designed the first building both ways. We've estimated the building both ways, and we know an awful lot about what goes into making not just a conventional building now, but a modular building. And what's remarkable about this town is that uh, if you ask somebody, you know, how many man hours go into building a conventional building, nobody could tell you. And so part of what this project has done for us is it's told us what's known about the industry and what's not. So if you said how many union jobs were created um, through um, union labor uh, and residential construction, versus non-union, all this data doesn't exist. And so as part of our R&D, we've done a lot of research. And um, what we know now is you know, how many hours it takes to build a conventional building, how many hours it would take to build a modular building. And it's, it's close. So it's not about the man hours. It's really about the efficiencies, uh, both time um, and cost, that are born out of working um, in, a, in a much more standardized and uh, efficient way. So we're excited about it. I, I don't know where it'll end up. As I said, uh, we want to start the first building um, by the end of this year, make an announcement, and begin construction um, in 2012. And um, the hard work that goes around the first building is really work that goes toward the benefit of the entire project because there are 16 buildings. And as I said, uh, you know, 15 of them at least are residential. So it's, it's a really interesting time for us. And all the while, as I said, we're building the arena. And uh, the arena will open, as I said, in September of 2012. And we're well on our way to executing um, on the entire development, which um, is exciting. So uh, you know, in terms of safety, it reduces work at the heights because uh, the men are not working um, and hanging from the steel. The mods are actually assembled in a factory, and uh, they're stacked. And the, and the uh, men and women that stack the mods on the site are on top of the mods. They're not hanging off at the side. So you have superior um, statistics in terms of site safety. Um, and you know, working inside of factories, obviously, um, uh, on a number of levels, a lot safer than, safer than a construction site. Less noise, dust, pollution, disruption, traffic, less neighborhood impact, fewer deliveries, and um, less site storage. Um, less trash, 90%, 70 to 90% less than traditional building methods. Um, and 90% um, fewer vehicle movements. And if you think about technology, you think about what goes into an airplane, you think about what's happening in the automotive industry. This is in some ways um, what we think uh, is going to happen in the construction industry, and this could be the, the start of uh, the construction industry really catching up in terms of technology. And with um, BIM systems, you know, uh, the, the way that we build buildings now in terms of 3D and 4D allow the kind of precision that's, uh, that's uh, important and necessary when you build this way in a factory. Because when you deliver the mods to the site, you have what's called mate line conditions. You've got to stack them. There have to be tolerances to allow the, the, the units to come together and to look like one finished product, uh, even though it's been built in components. And so um, uh, technology has really advanced the cause significantly. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's an idea whose time has come. So uh, like I said, the groundbreaking, that's a typo. Uh, the modular, we're hoping to start late 20. Uh, the announcement in late 2011 with construction commencing in early 2012. The building is 50% affordable, and thereafter we would like to break ground on at least one building uh, a year until the project's completion. So, um, I've said this, the current economic environment really forces us to create um, an opportunity to rethink solutions, 
uh, labor's changing, uh, unions are losing market share, the data shows us that. And um, this is a great opportunity for uh, union jobs to enter into a, an area that they up until now have not played a significant role in, which is um, affordable housing. And so we think it's a win-win all around, um, and that's uh, some of the conversations that we hope to be having soon, and we'll find out um, whether others agree. So with that, um, should I open up the, uh, the floor? Thank you, that was great. You sound much more convinced about the modular housing than a couple of months ago. Yeah, it's been this intense journey, and uh, you know I have to believe what I'm doing, or it's hard to—it's really hard to get out of bed every day. So I think I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid. Um, but you know what? It's uh, it's 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 really so compelling when you look at what's you know what's happened with technology. Yeah. Um, you know, it's 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 the iPhone. It's it's got to happen in the construction industry, and so I am hopeful that we can um, we can do this. Um, That's great. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, question. Hi. Hi. Is this on? Okay. The first was on the Gary building, and I was wondering, um, you mentioned that uh, you worked with him to demystify this idea of building tall. Um, I was curious if you could share kind of maybe what you did to help him guide, through, guide him through the process. And the other was about the um, subway station at Atlantic Yards. I was curious to know if there were incentives for you to put in the subway or if that was something you needed to do in order to get it approved by... Um, by the city. Great. So um, the Geary process, um, it started with making sure that things lined up. So when I talked about the torquing building, you know, we saw some early models where it was um, it, beautiful. I think it maybe ultimately became a vase at Tiffany's <laughs> because it was this beautiful <laughs> thing that Frank put together. Um, I would say um, not so buildable or predictable in terms of its constructability. And what's great about Frank is that he, um, you know, when you work with developers, I think you recognize that it's not, it's not like having a patron. And, uh, the, you know, you're slavishly devoted to the budget, and that's our job. And so um, I think that issues around um, building it um, efficiently, making sure that uh, where possible things stacked and lined up, uh, little things like when you walk into the apartment, it was great to see the sky and to look at Frank's beautiful curtain wall and have the beautiful window seat. But if you couldn't hang a painting uh, because all the walls moved, then you're not gonna do a great job of leasing it up. And so I think we had a lot of different goals um, and we shared a lot of his goals, but you know, sometimes we were just the bearer of the uh, unfortunate uh, reality news. And I think that um, that is some of what we had to contend with. The curtain wall itself um, was virtually unaffordable in the beginning. Um, and I think a lot of that is, oh, it's Frank Geary, and what happens is everybody just throws a lot more money at the estimate because it's Frank Geary, and who knows? And I think that demystifying that wall and doing what we call an early GMP for the wall. So we took the wall and said, let's treat it like its own little project. And we locked the price down, and because Frank works with very sophisticated software, if the price of the wall got too expensive, we could, with technology, just change the, the, the curvilinear nature of any particular component of the wall, flatten it out, and reduce the, uh, the, the, uh, the cost because we need repetition. So uh, there are um, 10,000 uh, different panels in the, in the Geary wall, but um, the repetition that we were able to achieve, we did through technology, but the pricing of it and the ability for us to nail the cost of that wall, lock it down, and know that we could actually afford it, we did very, very early on. And um, those are the things that we did to kind of demystify it because looking at the price of the wall initially, um, we would have ran, run as far away from it as we possibly could, but sticking with it and saying to Frank, we really, we were gonna use titanium. Titanium is very flimsy. Building of this height, the way it moves, the way it bends with the wind, the gauge of the titanium would never have sufficed at the height and the quantity that we were looking at, so we switched to stainless steel. So these are decisions that we came to together as partners, um, and um, you know, with the developer-architect relationship is great when there's mutual respect for what, um, what's needed, and I think that ultimately, Frank is really proud of the building. Um, you think about his um, 82 years, and how um, given where he is in his um, career, this is um, a great moment for him, because the building has been um, proclaimed by the New York Times architectural critic as perhaps the greatest building this city has seen in half a century. 
Um, and so, um, you know, that's pretty powerful and it's, um, it's powerful for us, but it's really powerful to somebody like Frank. So, um, so again, I think it's a testament to the kind of collaboration you need. Um, and, you know, Frank likes to remind us that in his early days, he did lots of apartment layouts, you know, before he became the Frank Erie that we all know. So their learning curve is incredible and they just, they get with the program very, very quickly. And so little things like ADA, you know, not getting caught up uh, too late in the game on whether your, uh, your corridors are the right size, whether your turning distances in your bathrooms are appropriate, just, you know, so many details. And we did it from afar, you know, his office is in um, Santa Monica. And again, another sign of what technology has done for us is that we designed this building in a bi-coastal way uh, with an architect that had never done a building of this scale on a residential format. And it's been uh, a tremendous success. Can you give us an inkling of the cost per square foot? No. <laughs> <laughs> my analyst I'll get in try. trouble I'll get in trouble <laughs> you know Frank likes to say um, and this is true that in terms of normative buildings you know we did this with Renzo Piano which is you know how do you harness that architectural genius genius and still make sure that things don't run amok because um, with the genius that goes on with great architecture is this need to be disciplined and so what we've been successful in doing is taking a normative building an honest to God normative construction budget and assigning a premium. And so really and truly, the New York Times building was built with a 10% premium to what we believed uh, Boston Properties was building the nearby towers for. And we basically said to the architects, you know, spend it as you wish, um, it's 10% more, and we've gotta figure it out. And um, we did the same thing with Frank. I, I don't know that it was 10% exactly, but I do think that, um, you know, a lot of the money was spent on the wall and then we made decisions together about where we thought the other premiums should be. And what we did is we measured that against the fact that we had extraordinary height and we had this, what we couldn't underwrite to was the impact of Frank Geary on a rental building because no lender, no investor, nobody in my company was gonna say, okay, I get it, you'll get 25 cents more a foot per floor uh, and another 25 cents per, uh, a floor because it's Frank Geary. We, we, we didn't know that. So what I'm really looking forward to when we can talk about it is after the building's leased up, and it may be leased up uh, you know, six months sooner than we thought, it'll be this great study in what actually garnered the premium because we do these extensive surveys with people and we think we know what makes them tick, at least what they tell us makes them tick. And um, it's such a big building that we'll be releasing the bottom part of the building as we finish leasing the top of the building. And so we're gonna have incredible data and uh, it'll tell us a lot about this great experiment of building um, a great architectural icon for rental product. And I think there's a second question about the, oh, the subway. So we did get um, a subsidy for the, for the overall project. The subsidy was from the city and state, uh, just over $200 million in subsidy. Um, the Metropolitan Transit Authority and the TA um, are not part of what I call the economic development aspect of the project. They were the ones that did the RFP for the, uh, for the land, um, the land that they controlled, and doing the subway entrance was part of our sort of ticket in. So we were required to renovate the subway entrance. And just by means of comparison, the subway entrance at the New York Times building, which was a developer requirement as well, didn't approach $2 million. And so when you compare $2 million with 70 million, you appreciate the complexities of putting a subway entrance at a location where it really, you know, either doesn't want to be because there's so much going on at the tip uh, in terms of below the surface, or perhaps more importantly, the subway system itself is so deteriorated um, that, you know, when I saw the when I saw the reports for the tunnel conditions, I was I was pretty clear that I, don't, I didn't really want to be in that subway station <laughs> because the MTA doesn't have money and they don't really invest in capital improvements unless they have to. So they really do wait for um, an emergency or a, a failure of a column or whatever it is. It doesn't happen very often, but the fact is it's a very old system. And if they were to start to undertake repair, extensive repairs throughout the system, it would be an extraordinary cost and the, ci and the city can't afford to do it. So what the TA says is, you know, you touch it, you own it. So if you go down there to create your little entrance and in all the while you touch a couple of beams and those beams extend out and hit tunnels that connect into the Long Island Railroad Station, you're responsible for repairing everything you touch within a certain radius. And so it becomes this, um, you know, uh, this, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Klingon effect where you started small, but it, it, it emanates out and you start to become responsible for things that you have nothing to do with and don't want anything to do with, but in order to get it done, you've got to take care of it. Uh, 
Um, I wanted to know about the modular construction. Is it possible to get big expanses like large living rooms, or are you confined to sort of small boxy rooms as it were? That's a good question. I mean, based on the way we're building the mods, um, there's a standard size mod, um, which is, um, you know, 14 by, by, by 30 feet. Um, but you can do half mods, you can do uh, full mods, and then based on the bracing system that we've designed, where the loads are transferred, you can actually create the living room experience without having every unit have a little cutout so that your living room is passed through a little doorway. So it's incredibly interesting the kind of design flexibility that you have. And this is the fine work of AREP engineers, which have been remarkable in terms of how the uh, structure has been dealt with. Because in addition to creating mods, we're stacking them into a lateral bracing system that's a skeleton that's being built on site as we put the mods together. And so um, uh, it is possible for us to get the kind of uh, living rooms and the kind of gracious uh, living spaces that we need. And I would submit that when we look at the images that we render these spaces, it would be impossible for anybody to know that the building were built modularly. And so that's obviously the goal, to make it sort of just an indecipherable fact about the building. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've obviously come to the conclusion, but not just, uh, not just for our city, even the people that market uh, for us at Spruce Street, these are uh, folks at City Habitats and uh, Nancy Pax. Uh, they have also weighed in on the fact that um, the units look great, and um, obviously the finishes have to be spot on, but if we uh, do the right thing and make the finishes um, meet the market, um, we think that it will be um, impossible to, to know the difference. So how does um, the, the program, that, the subsidy program that you use affect your lease up program? Um, because I know, you know, usually developers have a tendency to, to want to lease up the building and then raise rents. How does that, does that intimidate you at all? How do you handle that? So were you talking about Atlantic Yards or Spruce or both? Sorry, I'm, t I'm talking about, uh, a, well, both, sure. Well, I think... The Geary building, you said, had the, the program. So we have, four, yeah, we have a 421A tax abatement, which right, simply okay. means that there is a top side number for what you can charge in the building. And it's a formula that's derived from your costs. But um, the rents that we are getting in terms of uh, the increases that we're permitted over time um, are completely within the range. Like, we're not at all concerned about hitting that number. But it does mean that the people in the building are protected by rent stabilization. So uh, we can't just say the market will pay us twice um, what we were asking, so we're just going to double the rent. Um, we have to be cognizant of that fact. And I'll also say that in New York City, um, demand is really um, insatiable. Um, anything under 5% vacancy in this town is a housing emergency. Vacancy today is under 1%. So I believe if you build it, they will come. If you aren't leasing, it's pricing dislocation. And if you change your rent, it goes. So I still think that MEMA that's being built by related, you know, we need to be very aware of what, because consumers have choices. So I think the top side numbers, you know, it's not, it's not this endless sort of ceilingless uh, prospect for what we'll get. Um, um, but the good news is that on the, on the total rents, we are well within the, um, the required bands as proscribed by the 421A program. There's been some talk that the modules um, will be manufactured locally. Is that still the case, or do you know where, where, where? So we're not saying where, but here's what we are saying, which is that if we were able to do this, and again, this is still very much what I would call R&D on the cusp of possibly becoming reality, um, we um, will build it in a factory, a local factory. And this is a factory that we believe wants to be in Brooklyn. And like I said, the good news there is that there are lots of factories around. Um, so I think that um, we have options, and we have uh, quite a few very good options uh, should we have the opportunity to uh, exercise those options and uh, lease those factories. Yes. I was curious, what will your decision to choose Corten Steel for uh, the Barclays Arena, did you consider the environmental effects that might occur such as occurred at Woodhull Hospital in Brooklyn, where there's been extensive flaking of the iron oxide particles to the surrounding area. So it was an architectural decision. So clearly we were led uh, to this and embraced this through the architectural uh, vision for the building. We have um, uh, sealants and you know the experiments that are going on about how to make sure that the bleeding 
because also the rusting of it, you know, when the rainwater falls on it, you want to make sure that it doesn't produce uh, rusting of the, of the concrete and the areas around it. So um, this is part of what the mock-up process has done for us. And so we think we're sealing this in a way that has not been done before. And I think that um, the fact that we've been at it for a year means that we have panels that have been aged and have been out in the elements. And we are uh, watching and believe that it won't have the kind of flaking that we don't want to see um, and that it will not have the kind of runoff and the bleeding um, that we've seen elsewhere. So we've tried to learn from the experiences out there. And then again, because uh, technology and the mock-up process has allowed us to experiment with different sealants, um, we, th we think we're addressing um, the problem. And obviously, if it turns out that there are issues once we're in the field, we're going to have to deal with it um, when, we, when we get to it. But we're optimistic that we've kind of figured it out. Yes? I'm really fascinated by this modular construction. I know there's already been a couple questions about it. Um, I guess first question, what, what's the cost savings versus traditional construction? Is it 3%? Is it 30%? And also, you made some, some really great points, some pros for it. I'm sold on it. But what are some of the downside? What's some of the downside and some of the risks associated with it that are, that are holding up your decision as to whether or not to proceed with it in 2012? Well, thank you for your words of encouragement. But if I told you the cost savings, I'd have to kill you, so I can't. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you will. <laughs> um, I think it's safe to say that it would need to be compelling because we're taking on something that needs to be sizable enough because you have to imagine that you're going to screw it up a little bit the first time around. I think it's going to get better as you build more of it. So factoring in um, the oopses, you know, we've, we think there's a good margin there, a margin that, let me just say, it exceeds 5%. Um, and so if we're right, and I think it's uh, on paper looking uh, compelling enough where we, we want to go to the next step. So for us, we're sold on it too. I think uh, before we had the height figured out, we were perplexed by why hasn't it been done. And what we realized that most of the places around the world, you know, density is not necessarily an issue. So in Wolverhampton, why they built it 24 stories is because they wanted a 24-story building. Um, and um, it's not because they couldn't go any higher, they just didn't, that's the building that they prescribed. I think in places like New York where you have logistics issues, staging issues, you're, you know, you have crane issues, you're, you're picking up these mods which weigh 30,000 pounds each, and you're swinging them into place, you know, there are issues around the logistics. I can tell you that I believe we have um, eager supporters in the city at the buildings department for this. Um, and in fact, lots of schools and low rise uh, single family houses have been built this way. So I think that once we um, figured out the height and we really believe we have, it really gets down to we are uh, deeply committed to union labor. And uh, union labor in New York on a construction basis is on site. And uh, you have a lot of work here that's not done on site. It's done in a factory. And what we have to do is we have to forge a partnership with the trades to be able to do this in a way that doesn't produce a standoff and really produces something um, that makes everybody feel like they won. Um, and I think that's kind of where we are right now. And so, um, you know, the unions have moved uh, in a progressive way forward, recognizing with their PLAs, for example, their project labor agreements, that we live in a very different world. And so um, we're on the advent of, uh, I think, that, that discussion where we hope to be able to, uh, to introduce sort of a new business line for uh, the construction industry and recognizing that not only can we be doing this all over New York City, but we could be shipping these mods elsewhere. You know, it doesn't have to stop at just feeding uh, this great New York City market. It can really go well beyond that. Uh, and so we have an interest in only one aspect of modular. We don't want to build modular hospitals. We don't want to build single family homes. We only want to build high-rise modular, but we would like to do it everywhere. Do you allow for the effect of uh, earthquake and the wind effect? And uh, also, I'd like to know the total cost of the project. I'm sorry, the first question was, did we allow for the Earthquakes, yeah, seismic. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the you seismic get, effect. Yeah. And, uh, in New York City, you don't get to choose whether you want to do that or not. They tell you you have to. I thought it was funny when the when the um, the storm came through um, in the city and and uh, the hurricane and uh, the post. You know, when they evacuated downtown, there was some crazy quote in the New York Post and 
the, the residents said that I feel really safe in my Geary Tower because it was designed by Frank Geary. <laughs> <laughs> As if somehow that was going to produce a safer building. But the point is that the curtain walls, the curtain walls, it turned out to be, um, you know, we asked everybody in the apartment to leave there, um, make sure that their, uh, that their windows uh, were closed and I think you know one window was open and it produced one faulty piece of glass but all in all with a tall building like that we had very little uh, movement which is a good thing and uh, very little uh, breakage of the glass uh, like I said I I won't talk about the total cost of the project it was expensive <laughs> You know, the financing was $680 million, so if you just think about that, it approaches, uh, you know, a billion dollars. In terms of all said, all, all in with the school, you're talking about a project that approaches a billion. I'm still dizzy from the $100 this year. So. Yeah. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> um, so. Uh, yeah, I feel, I feel guilty because I came late, so I don't want to keep you late, but I'm certainly happy to answer uh, at least one more question if there is one. Otherwise, um, Could we hear just a little bit about uh, more of your background, how you got here, and any advice that you'd have for uh, aspiring real estate developers? Sure. So first I have to say to you that um, I graduated um, in the late 80s, not so late actually, 86. <laughs> and um, I will tell you that being a real estate developer was one step above a car salesman. So nobody wanted to do what I do. And so it's all by uh, serendipity. And I think that um, living by some master plan, even though we, we can talk about master plans, um, a lot here, but you know, a life master plan for me really, it didn't, it's not what happened. So I won a fellowship, an urban fellowship, which was the city's only real recruitment tool to try to get young talent into government before they ran off to the private sector to make millions of dollars. And so I accepted this fellowship and you were able to pick the agency you wanted to work at. And I had won both the summer and the academic year, so I had two fellowships to work with. So I started my tour around the city, and this is an amazing program, it's called the Urban Fellows Program, and all the commissioners will meet with you because you're a free labor. They don't have to use their budget to pay for you, so it comes out of a scholarship fund. And so you're basically um, you know, seduced by all the commissioners, like come to my agency. It's not that, it's not that glamorous, but you know, the idea is you can work wherever you want. And so I started to go to the places I wanted to work, and truth be told, it was horrible. I mean, the city is as good looking in terms of the public's, uh, the, the, the public's um, office space as it's you know, ever been. It, it was dreadful. So they would show me like chairs in the hallway and say, so we don't have an office for you. Not forget an office, we, don't, we can't put you inside the office. You'll sit in the hallway, but we got rid of the mice. I would be like, you know, that's crazy. So I really honestly was completely smitten with the fact that at Public Development Corporation, they had air conditioning, carpet, and they had a president, not a commissioner. I thought, you know, this is pretty good. I'm going to spend the summer here because it's completely outside my nine dots. I don't have any interest in doing this. And I have this other fellowship. So in September, I'll get serious about law school and doing what I want to do. Lo and behold, I, you know, what happened is I got it in my veins and I suddenly realized this is amazing. And in those days, it's EDC now, it was PDC then. And a public development corporation, they literally would like hand you a map of Manhattan and say, you know, go figure out the west side. Just think about what we should put over by the Hudson River and 42nd Street. It was crazy. So you're in room with a lot of young people and uh, it quickly became the go-to place when real estate started to take hold. But I am simply the beneficiary of a place that nobody wanted to really work. You know, real estate was just not the thing. Everybody was flocking to the internet. And um, it takes a long time to do stuff. So I have 17 years in a business where I managed to eke out a couple of buildings, a couple of really good buildings, and it's all about what you build. So the platform is really important. So I think the advice I would give you is, I think that if you had to go to a lesser firm with a really good mentor, um, as a compared to a great firm with you know no mentoring, I think you really got to think about people that can teach you the business and give you the exposure. Um, but you want to be doing stuff too, so you really have to go where if, if building ground up is your thing, um, then I would consider government because um, it is a great place to cut your teeth on some really complicated large scale projects. And if you can afford to do that, I think that it's a great place to start. Um, and then I think you know go where the action is and. Um, but you gotta be ready for the long haul. See, the problem is the resumes I see are objects of beauty. I mean, you're, you're people, you know, you, you have been from the cradle thinking about becoming a professional in real estate. And so I see these resumes and it's, 
remarkable. I mean, the skill set and the 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 breadth of, um, of 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 conviction and training. The real problem, though, is that until you do it, you really don't know how to do it. And so I have this group of young people, and it's all about, you know, we believe in baptism by fire, so we just throw you right in and um, love you to death. So I think that you really want to be in on the action. And, you know, it's great to, as I say, and then I'll stop, there are sort of three legs to the stool, construction, um, finance, and marketing. And if you can nail one of those three and know it cold and have a pretty good understanding of the other two, you're in good shape. So if construction's your thing and you know the business, you want to be able to market and lease because you want to drive the revenue and you want to understand the way a building is financed because uh, we don't build them with equity and the leverage concept for many of us is very important. So um, that would be my advice is, you know, pick a, one of those three and master it and then learn the other two to the extent possible. And, um, you know, I think, uh, I think that development will come back again in this town. I think we're going to go into some uh, rough patches. I think that the absence of, uh, of money, I mean, there's a lot of private capital and a lot of equity on the sidelines, but financing is very, very hard to come by. And so um, the nice thing about New York is the, the sky didn't fall. The fundamentals are still quite good. And I think we're still open for business. So I think it's a great business. I will only say to you that I have three children and I realize that in this world, we push a lot of paper and it, not a lot of tangible stuff to point to. And so I, I love the fact that I can point to a building it's like when we used to farm and bring the crops home. It's just nice when you have a tangible result from all of your labor. And so I consider it to be a great blessing that I can look at a building in the skyline and say, I had a little something to do with it. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, everyone. That was very much worth the wait, and I just, I wanted to make a quick introduction, so I just want to say in closing that Marianne represents the best of this business, and so we're very, very privileged to have her here. Thank you very much. And I want to say as a consolation prize for my being late um, that I would love to host for your class um, a cocktail reception at the Spruce Street Tower where, if you're interested, we can, um, we can have um, conversation uh, on the terrace, and uh, it'll more than make up for the half hour. So. <laughs> All right. I'd love it. I'm We're going to take you up on that. Thanks great. very much for that. Thank That's you. Great.